Are you a Muslim who's married or looking to get married? I'm sure you've heard that more than 50% of Muslim marriages are ending in a divorce. Now that's unfortunate, but there's help out there. My name is Hina Mirza. I'm a registered psychotherapist with a specialization in Islamic counseling. And I've been working with hundreds of couples building healthy, happy, strong marriages. Sign up for the course that I just completed with Happy Strong Family to foolproof your marriage and make sure that you have all the right tools and all the right skills to lead a healthy, happy, strong life with your partner. Assalamu alaikum everyone. Welcome back to our Happy Strong Family Podcast. Today we are here with Sister Huda Adnan. Huda Adnan is a South Asian Muslim female therapist. She draws on her personal journey of overcoming challenges to offer genuine support for mental health. With a master's in social work, bachelor's in social work, and a social service worker diploma from Toronto Metropolitan University, she brings over 10 years of experience as a registered social worker. Huda's approach centers on actively listening to client stories and collaboratively finding ways to navigate life's obstacles. She is the founder of Nural Huda, um, the de uh, dedicated to providing culturally responsive care to the community. Welcome to our podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here today. Of course, no problem. I'm really excited to talk about um, generational trauma. We already started our conversation on the phone yes. that day. I was like, I don't want to get off the call. <laughs> oh, well, you yeah. have my number. You can give me a call anytime. Right? Just like right. Let's just do the podcast on the call. That's I how know, I felt that honestly. day. Um, but what can you tell us a little bit about um, generational trauma, just as like a definition? Yeah, so generational Generational trauma is really trauma. There's so many different types of trauma, but this specific kind of trauma is trauma that has been t passed down literally gener generationally. So this can be emotional, it can be psychological, it can even be physical, but really think of it as something that is passed down. So sometimes it may not be trauma that you have experienced, but someone in your family, such as like parents or grandparents, or even just like from the cultural background you come from, just like your country, just being it, it being like a systematic issue as well. So that's just a really, I guess, like brief definition of what generational trauma is. But really think of it as something that's being passed down to you. Exactly. Yeah. And I remember yeah. this is something we spoke about, which is like, well, how do we address generational trauma? Yeah, I think the really the biggest part in the first place I would start with is really having an understanding and awareness of what generational trauma is. So even with me and like the work that I do, there may be clients that I have that are experiencing some kind of like grief or distress that may not actually be theirs. And there's a, there's this term actually that I was taught by one of my indigenous elders in school, and it's called blood memory. And so what that means, it's memories that come not necessarily from you and your own experience but things that may have happened to your parents or your grandparents that get passed down genetically it's into funny. you that you may be experiencing wow. yeah so I think that awareness and having education about what generational trauma is is really important because a lot of people experience this distress and this grief that actually may not even be theirs but it may be something that has been passed down to them genetically mm -hmm. Genetically, would you say even from like a biological perspective, is there research that stress, it yeah. has an effect, right? Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. I know one of the things I was reading into recently is something called womb trauma. And it's so interesting. So it's trauma in the womb that like moms who may be distressed, um, who may be in, you know, experiencing a domestic violence relationship, yeah. who may be experiencing a lot of anxiety, they may be actually passing that down unknowingly Sometimes to their fetus that's in in their womb wow. yeah so those cells actually pass down so sometimes I have clients that have a lot of anxiety yeah. and it may not actually be theirs it may be something that their mother has experienced or something that even their father has experienced that's passed down into their wound so sorry into their womb so there's a lot of um, research that and specifically from Indigenous folks, I've been learning this from about intergenerational trauma and womb tra trauma specifically. But yes, it is it is genetics. 
Subhanallah, that's beautiful. Yeah. I know I've heard a similar concept of what you had mentioned of womb trauma. Right. I didn't know there was a name for it. Yeah. But the fact that it was actually rooted in science, I was like, someone once told yes. me, but I didn't know if that was <laughs> real. Yeah, that makes yeah. a lot of sense that we can actually pass down like stress yes. and anxiety exactly. um, from our from our realities. So yeah, it's I think true. especially like just from so, something that we were discussing was just mm -hmm. this concept of, well, a lot of times in our current, like, not just society, but especially from, like, a North American lens, it's always, yes. okay, <laughs> trauma equals therapy. You yes. know, there's no <laughs> other way around. And I was telling you, yeah. we were speaking about that. I was telling you, yeah, that's, that's exactly how, how th I thought of it. But I know right. you have a very different approach. Could you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, definitely. And again, like, I am a trained therapist, so I say this very cautiously. And I don't mean to, like, you know, dump on other therapists. I definitely get it. You know, we want to support people on an individual level, on an interpersonal level as much as we can. But I think what's also important to understand is that it's not enough to just do therapy. Think of it like a very holistic package. It's one aspect of our healing and of our treatment. But the thing is, we need to really look into collective care because we're not meant to heal individually on our own mm -hmm. in isolation, right? And, you know, therapists can really teach you certain interpersonal skills that are very unique to your experience. And yeah. that is amazing. That's great. But you're only there for that one hour, maybe once a week. What about all that other time outside of that, right? Mm -hmm. So there's so many other components that we need to look into when it comes to our healing and our treatment. And I love collective and community care. I really feel like healing with other folks who are also healthy and have that capacity to be gay you know, to be able to give and receive that love and care is so important because we're meant to be around people. We're, we're social beings. Um, and so it's so important for us to engage in so many other aspects of care, whether that's movement, whether that's music therapy, whether that's, you know, like um, being at the masjid and doing like different programs. But really and truly for all of my lines that I have, I I don't think I have ever just recommended just therapy. There's always so many other components we need to look at when it comes to our care that's so important. Um, and an example of that actually is I, because I love being in community. Yeah. I'm actually going to do a workshop soon with a group of women this summer um, about healing from trauma. And I have plans of like doing different interactive activities uh, because I think it's so important and we need to do this work beyond just individual one on one therapy. Exactly. Um, what would you say collective care brings to healing generational trauma specifically? Hmm. So I think sometimes what happens, and I've noticed this with some clients, is sometimes when they've experienced trauma from their like cultural community specifically, yeah. what's really easy for us is to avoid and then like remove ourselves from that situation, right? Yeah. And I can definitely understand that as someone who is avoidant myself. But I think what's really important is for us to reconnect to the healthier parts of our community. So whether, for example, that's like music or whether that's something like um, prayer or something, you know, specific, you know, because most of our audience today uh, may be Muslim and maybe like reconnecting with Islam. But I think it's reconnecting with those healthier parts of our culture that exists but again when we experience that trauma it's so easy for us to sit in that trauma and kind of label it as like oh this culture has caused me and this religion may have caused me so much grief mm -hmm. but it's trying to contextualize that yes this was my experience but we need to look at the foundation in the history because we know historically there's so much healing that is in Islam that we can tap into oh subhanallah this is almost like that concept of there's a lot of people who say, well, like I left the religion, for example, right? And you right. go into deeper reasons why. And it's like the community completely cut them off. Yeah. Their families, their communities. And they're like, "Where? what can I even find here if I can't find anything in my religion anymore? Exactly. Because in many senses, like religion does play, community is actually religion in a sense like exactly. our community space of the masjid if someone feels like they're not welcome there right. or if they feel bullied at a masjid yes. then it's like how are we going to bring someone like that back exactly so that's, yeah 
I didn't even connect the two that that could would you say that's like connected yeah. to generational trauma yeah I don't think like I truly and I try to think the best of people to be honest um, it may be like a little naive but for me I don't think that truly people are evil and mean people I think that there's something that is unhealthy that has happened to them that they don't have the resources to be able to cope in a way maybe they have not been taught how to be self-aware maybe they haven't been taught how to love and take care of other people mm -hmm. um, so i don't think that people are innately mean hurtful and harmful people i think these are people who have not been supported i think these are people who have not been given the resources to take care of themselves and to learn how to take care of others yeah. but i think we really have to contextualize people beyond that and i know even for me like you know sometimes there's an auntie at the masjid that's mean <laughs> in our community for oh, yeah. no reason exactly. like it's just unprovoked I for know, no reason just yelling at all the volunteers and I know. Like, Why? <laughs> or yelling at the kids for being too yeah. loud and it has who brings kids to the right. it's so bad yeah. yeah and I think it's so no. important to contextualize that person about yeah. like what is it that is so triggering for you right like what yeah. is really going on for you because most of the time it actually may not have anything to do with us like us who are receiving the harm yeah people who perpetuate that harm I think there's something unhealed inside of them like a wound in their soul that needs to be healed that needs to be addressed and if we are more compassionate and I know it's hard I, I know if you've been wronged and if you've been hurt I know it's hard trust me I, I know <laughs> um, but yeah. I think it's so important con to contextualize people and have compassion for them because nobody behaves a mean and hurtful way unless they've been harmed that's exactly. what i i believe and i think i have the i have a very similar philosophy yeah because i feel like yeah. at the end of the day like that's what they're projecting and that's what's yes. coming from within them right? right so in any situation it's never you as the other person but it's what they are going through that they're putting out into yeah. this world and then we have exactly. that choice as well every single second of our life too to, exactly. to bring something out and of course it's something if it's something harmful mm -hmm. that means it's coming from within but mm -hmm. I really appreciate kind of like us almost like separating that out because I do think of course there's that concept of people taking accountability for yes. their actions right? yes of course and then at the same time there's well something such as generational trauma which when we're speaking about it even more mm -hmm. I feel like it's so much like it's so much more complex than I thought of it it's like oh yeah it's just like something yes that, you know generational <laughs> trauma is like something happened in the family and that's right. gonna have an impact no it's actually boom it's like yes. it's passed down genuinely passed down from the body to the next body which exactly. I was like that's, that's crazy that means there's something so much deeper going on inside of us internally exactly yeah, absolutely. And I think the thing is, like, especially in North American society, yeah. and especially when it comes to therapy, we're so quick to individualize a person and, you know, put the onus, put the responsibility on them, like do yeah. your CBT, do your homework, exactly. <laughs> do your breathing exercise. And okay, yeah. there's an aspect of accountability for people. Yeah. I agree that there is. But I think what's also important is that we hold these structural institutions that has caused this grief to people and causes distress to people like there's so many examples i think of like of my clients that i can so clearly see yeah. these can systemic us... barriers yeah. yeah so i know i had one client for example he was new to the country he was a newcomer and he was so depressed and anxious yeah. and we literally just i just straight up asked him what do you need He's like, just give me a job, Hada. If you give me a job, I'll be able to financially provide for my family and yeah. pay for rent and buy my kids food. And I was like, this is a very real structural barrier, right? Exactly. It's like thinking of like if you someone who's homeless and unhoused, you can't subscribe, you know, prescribe to them to do CBT and change their thought process. They literally don't have a house. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So there's very much these very oh, real yeah. systemic barriers that impact people and cause exactly. so much grief. Yeah. and so much distress for them and I think it's important for all of us to contextualize those pieces because it's so easy to label someone as unwell and depressed and anxious but what I would really encourage folks to ask instead is what has happened to this person that is causing them to behave this way like look at them really really holistically wow look at their environment look at their school environment their work environment their family environment did their families come from colonized countries that's like another huge aspect that folks miss are they experiencing racism at work 
Um, there's so many aspects that I feel like we need to consider, but we have to be so reflective about all of these intersectional barriers because so often we miss them and then we blame the person and we put the responsibility on them. But it's it's not that easy. There's so many aspects we need to consider. Yeah, and it's such a it's it's a very uh, real way of looking at people's situations because yes. I think, yeah. and of course, for me too, I'm we spoke about this like we love therapy we think it's great <laughs> yes. but then at the same time it's like for someone who came without housing breathing right. exercises is not going to fix your situation they literally said just get me a house you know like <laughs> yes. i need this situation to change yes exactly. to a certain extent like it is actually the way you think about it but right. if it's reality then we need to work on the reality yes. and i feel like when you're talking about collective community care which is actually like getting someone that job that's such a it's such a great way of like bringing in social work into yeah. psychotherapy because it's like it's not Absolutely. just what they're going through but all these barriers that's making them have an impact on their mental health exactly um and i think wow like just as you're speaking about it, it's just hitting me so deeply because I feel like how many times have we looked at someone in our right. own family and community and said, yes. they just need to go therapy. I oh, know. they're just so broken. Like that's what, or we did that to ourselves, right? I just right. need to go to therapy. But it's like, what was the actual problem? Exactly. And yeah. I think for many of us, we start to feel so uncomfortable when we see folks that are behaving in a way that, that may be deemed as like dysregulated or ways that may be inappropriate or may be harmful so we want to find like that quick solution and always often that quick solution is like yeah just go to therapy yeah. but what if we actually look at the environment what has this person actually experienced that has causing them to behave this way you know what i mean we really need to look at folks very holistically and very compassionately and really contextualize where they're coming from because exactly. we don't really know what people are experiencing. People are experiencing a lot of grief and a lot of distress, but we need to be more compassionate is really what I'm trying to say. Exactly, yeah. I remember um, on call we were talking about, uh, you had given me an example of the, I think it was a Palestinian, um, it was a family yeah. and family therapy. Are you comfortable sharing that example? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think what's really important for us, especially as we're, especially during the context right now, when we're looking about, you know, supporting our Palestinian clients and our Palestinian families and communities, yeah. it's so important for us to contextualize the very violent systemic barriers and violence that they continue to experience and how that impacts them. So we need to work at a more systemic level, right? We need to be focus more on advocating. Because the thing is, you cannot, like this is a really, especially uh, folks who are Palestinian, you cannot just look at them as an individual. You have to look at them as a system, as a context, look at the intergenerational trauma that they're experiencing. There's one um, psych psychiatrist that I am following. Her name is Dr. Sama Jawar. She is absolutely brilliant. And she spoke about how we can't use the concept of PTSD when working with our Palestinian clients mm -hmm. because the trauma is so persistent and it's so consistent. So we need to be mindful about these structural barriers that are impacting our clients, especially our clients who are experiencing colonization like in a very real time presently. Exactly, and when we look at colonization as that structure, that's a barrier that's making it hard for someone to even like function day to day. Then right. it's like, how can you even ascribe anything else to someone? Exactly. Um, yeah. How would you say like uh, <laughs> with collective care, um, just like from like a real life example of how you've like applied it, how, how, right. how would that look? Because I feel like for many of our audience members and for myself included, mm -hmm. it's like I'm not really able to wrap my head around. Well, what does it look like? Yeah, definitely. So I think before we actually jump into collective care, we need to work on interpersonal care first, mm -hmm. because the thing is, if we are not well and if we don't love ourselves, we're not going to be able to love and take care of other people. So before we go into collective care, we have to look at ourselves as an individual and make sure that we're well and able to receive others. Um, but really for me, what I define as collective care is really finding your people, finding your community, whether it's like, you know, 
attending workshops or being in groups, you know, if you're a student, like being in student groups of folks who share the same identity and interest as you mm -hmm. and being, you know, being able and even with friends, being able to be in a safe and supportive space where you can authentically be yourself. Because in so many places for us, like, if, you know, even for me, I think about like work, you have to put your professional hat on. And then with yeah. family, you have to like, <laughs> not get triggered by the certain things that they sometimes say. Yeah. Um, from folks in the community but we need to be in spaces where we can authentically be ourselves and hold space for others to really love and take care of them as well i think a huge part of healing is being with others um, who share similar interests as you and who are similar you know to your same identity as well um, because I think what happens is we're often, especially in North American society, we're often on our own. You know, some of us may be just working yeah. from home and just being a student at home, just being married at home, you know, like supporting our in-laws, all of those aspects. But we need to be like in groups around people and folks who are healthy yeah. you, and able to receive and take care of us. And we're able to reciprocate that as well. But so often we're isolated. And even for myself as someone who works from home, like I feel that as well. And so I have to be very intentional about planning that time to be with people who I love and they love me as well. And, you know, to be in that supportive space where I can just be myself authentically. Um, I really appreciate that lens because I feel like just looking at it from, as you mentioned, the independence that comes with being North American yes. um, is very, it's it's a huge, like, it's a huge, it's like a responsibility to be able to be on your own right. and do things exactly. on your own and be okay on your own too. Yes. So all of that combined. <laughs> and I'm curious if it's almost like with individual, uh, more independent societies, if maybe therapy is one of those things. Because as you said, interpersonal care is the first thing. And if you don't have other people, a huge group of other people to look for or to be in, then maybe yeah. that's something that works. But I'm right. so curious to see what I'm like, my background's Pakistani. I wonder if from, mm -hmm. from where I come from, if it really is actually about collective care, because right. there's like, I, I sometimes look at these posts from uh, someone I, I saw. I remember this post in, from someone who's Pakistani and they mm -hmm. said, my healing is sitting with a cup of coffee and so, sorry, cup of tea with my friends outside, like on chairs. And it's just yeah. giving me an image because I've been to Pakistan. I'm like, oh, my God, I've seen <laughs> so many people. They bring out their tea. They're on chairs yes. and all of them have a <laughs> talk and they're good. They're like, that's my therapy. And I remember right. seeing a post like that and thinking, how could that be therapy? But now I'm starting yeah. to understand it. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's where I say like, and truthfully, as a therapist, therapy doesn't work for everyone. I wouldn't recommend it for everyone. Some people need to be in groups of people who are very caring and loving and they that is what they're feel that fills their cup. And for some people, they like that individual one on one support with a therapist, and that fills their cup. So every person is very unique and complex and very nuanced, right. So I want us to also consider that as well. But definitely, we know like from for like for me, my backgrounds in culturally responsive care. Yeah, there's different ways of healing that is outside of North American society that I don't think we really tap into. Exactly. So one of my really uh, good friends from uh, Turkey, actually, she is studying music therapy. Yeah. And I remember she was sharing with me that like historically in the Ottoman times when people were like really depressed and really anxious, they would like now you know, they're in psychiatric wards. Yes. But before, in the Ottoman times, what they would do is they had different forms of um, music and different notes that heal different illnesses. And so I was so fascinated when she was teaching me that. But there's so many different ways that I think we've used historically in like indigenous practices that were being used, like movement, for example. We know that for women, actually, they carry a lot of their emotions and their stress in their hips. Oh. Yeah, right. So like, for example, like different forms of dancing, obviously, and like if you're a Muslim in a Muslim, a woman only space and so forth. Um, but there's ways there's different ways of healing that is beyond therapy. And again, like if you feel like therapy works for you, that's great. Of course, I'm a therapist. I definitely understand. But I think <clears throat> that's only one aspect. We have to look at all the other components that yeah. come with that as well. Yeah, and open ourselves to even understanding those as healing. Right. But I'm like, music, how's that healing? It's yes. healing. <laughs> it is. And yeah. the fact that, you know, they, as you said, like uh, in Turkey, they, they made it a community healing. Yeah. They were like, no, you're struggling. We're not going to put you, right. we're not going to isolate you. We're going to bring you into the community and you're going to heal. Exactly. So that's that's a very like, 
I think it's a, I, I find it revolutionary because Me I've too. never, right? Like, it's almost like you're taking us back, right? Right. You're taking us back to different forms of healing. But in doing that, that's right. what maybe generational like healing is is mm-hmm. actually seeing well how did our ancestors heal exactly from the traumas that they were holding from right. that generation it, when it was being passed down what exactly. were some of the things that people were doing to heal at the same time exactly and i think there's a lot <coughs> there's a lot that we can learn um from what our ancestors and even like what our muslim umma did historically mm-hmm. Right. Like I'm thinking, for example, I know Hazrat Aisha, she did a lot of teaching within the community. Yeah. Right. So we know like culturally I'm half Pakistani and mix. I know like now it's very interesting when I see like these cultural nuances of like this very strong patriarchy where, you know, women are expected to be at home and so forth. Um, but we know historically Muslim women were at the forefront of our Oma teaching. Exactly. Like they were teaching right yeah. and so we really need to tap back into what we're folks doing previously and try to see how we can implement those ways yeah subhanallah and i didn't even think about that as like teaching is a form of like this was her way of like you know she was giving like a huge scholar of hadith yeah and after the prophet Muhammad passed away she was one of the from what i know top women who actually uh, circulated exactly. and uh, like um, transferred hadith so that's that's like a huge form of like you know being able to as a woman exactly. do so much for the community our like right. our mother basically the mother of our of the believers mm-hmm. she was able to create so much change so of course yes. that's that's something that we can all use to exemplify exactly and that's why i so strongly am so passionate about teaching within the community i teach Mm. a lot of webinars and workshops because i feel like yes again like if you want to go to therapy that's great but ultimately for me i want my clients to be able to have the skill set to be able to be healthy and independent on their own so i love teaching collectively as a group because that way we're teaching folks the skills to be able to function in a way that's healthy and to be able to heal with each other collectively. Cause you know, when you, some, a lot of the times we think like, am I the only one that experienced intergenerational trauma? When there is so many of us who have experienced this. So imagine if we're together, like in a space and able to talk about our narratives and our experiences and heal like together. Yeah. Imagine how fruitful that would be. Exactly. Um, I'm, from what you just said, I was just uh, thinking, like, how can someone, because what we said about intergenerational trauma is it's hard to see sometimes. So how can right. someone ask themselves, well, how has intergenerational trauma impacted me or my mm. well-being? Like, if it has first and how, how has it? Right. Right. Hmm. That's a really good question. I would suggest actually something like a mapping exercise. So really digging deeper into your identity. Mm -hmm. So for example, if you're someone who comes from a colonized country, right, like I'm mixed South Asian. um, So I know that my ancestors have experienced colonization. Um, So there's some of the ways actually that it shows up even presently like for example i know for uh, pakistanis like skin bleaching is really really big but where does that beauty standard of whiteness come from Mm. because that's not you know that's not from us that came from somewhere else and there's certain things like our food and our dietary pieces like white sugar that wasn't something that was brought like we didn't have it naturally organically it wasn't native to our land it's something that was brought over from who (laughs) right so i would say be really reflective in terms of your family right so really thinking about like where your parents are from the country that you're from doing a little bit of history there um and just like being aware of what you are feeling so sometimes Mm -hmm. i've worked with my clients who are indigenous who just have experienced so much grief and they don't know where it's from but if you dig into their family history there's residential schooling, for example. Um, So really getting to know your identity and looking deep, a little bit deeper into your history, I think would be a really good first start. Just learning about yourself, like truly. Oh, that's beautiful. And learning about your ancestors. I don't, yeah, yeah. Exactly. And I also want to like express, I know so often we're, like our brain is just wired to 
to hold on to the negative. Yeah. But I also want us to think about all the positive things that our ancestors and our Muslim Ummah has yeah. done as well. Exactly. Because it's so so often we're able like, you know, to hold on like, man, why are my parents so annoying? Like, why don't they don't understand me? Why are my grandparents telling me to get married and have a kid, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, and so, yes, there's those components that are hurtful and harmful. But I also want us to think about the healthy and the positive pieces that you know that have been passed down to us like resiliency us surviving even though we've been colonized people right exactly. so i want us to kind of like have a balance i don't want us to sit in the in the i guess negativity is what i'm saying yeah as soon as you like right before you said that i was thinking as you're saying what's been passed down i was thinking about my dad and how he's explained that really far back in our like ancestry line there were we had like warriors and yes. they actually like fought. And I was like, oh, that's so cool. Yes. And whenever I yes. remember like sitting since I was young, where dad has been telling us that he's like, we oh, have that. They were warriors. Like the there's yes. like the last name, Malik, whatever it was, the way we've right. been connected to them. Um, a group where it's like even like outside of Pakistani Muslim Bihari. So yes. going into that and then realizing that, wow, like no way they're actually ancestors. They were they were warriors, they're people who fought. Exactly. And it's just like just knowing that is okay. They were resilient. So the fact that you just explained that, I was just thinking that that's exactly how we can also frame it is there's so much positivity and so much exactly. good that we have been able to carry on till today. Exactly. Yeah. And even thinking about our ancestors, how they survived colonization was not easy. Yeah. There was folks who were very intentional about trying to wipe us away, especially if we come from colonized countries. But how resilient were they that they passed that on and they had that intention that we're passing that on to our descendants. Exactly. So we have that resiliency inside of us. We come from free freedom fighters and warriors we have a lot of strengths that we have to remember they survived right exactly so we are here for a reason there's a purpose that we are here wow it's yeah. so beautiful thank you um, i know um something we said we would touch upon is also very uh like maybe concrete resources mm. that people can look into um, in order to heal. So uh, how right. would you go about explaining those? Yeah, so in terms of resources, I actually wrote an ebook around newcomer and refugee mental health. Um, so if folks are ever interested in reading a little bit more, just because I know we only have an hour today. Um, so that's something that I wrote a little bit more deeper about and some tangible strategies and reflection pieces that we can use. Um, I would say like the first Sorry, thing- the, What was the ebook about? What is it's it? about newcomer and refugee mental newcomer health. Refugee, yeah. Newcomer and refugee yeah. mental health, subhanAllah. But yeah. uh, this is something we discussed that a lot of times people won't think of themselves right. as newcomer refugee. Uh, exactly. what, what is your take on that? Yeah, so the thing is, like, it's interesting because even for me, it took me a while to grapple with this. But if I'm speaking specific uh, to Canada and Canadians, so unless we are Indigenous, we are in newcomers to this land even if we're born here like i was Remember? born here yeah i know i'm not a newcomer I was born here. <laughs> that's me too yeah. that is me too yeah. but like i also want us to honor our indigenous brothers and sisters that this is their land and we're here as newcomers and um you know as as settlers as well so i want yeah. us to be mindful of those components and again there's like maybe we need to tease out that <laughs> a little bit more but that's why i write a little bit about that because i want us to be very reflective about who are we and what are we doing on this land how did we actually end up on this land um and that's an activity that i learned from my indigenous elders that i wanted to share i always credit them i learned so much from them um but i write about that a little bit in my ebook so that is the first re resource i would recommend the second piece i would recommend is really just truly loving yourself and having compassion towards yourself I think a lot of the times that part is so easily missed. We get so caught up with like work and like with family and what, what's going on, you know, in the world. But really us having that self-compassion and that love for ourselves will be able to take care of other people if we're able exactly. to do that. Um, and then honestly, find your find your people if you can, like really find your people where you can authentically be yourself, you know, support others, receive that support um, and really just feel good about who you are and in, in your identity. So those are a few like bits and tangible pieces that I'm thinking about in terms of resources that are 
I hope are helpful for folks. And then folks Definitely. are always welcome to reach out to me. I'm more than happy to chat things through yes, as for well. Sure. Where can um, people reach you? Um, I think email would be best <laughs> because sometimes on Instagram, when I get like DMs from folks, I like can't respond back for some strange reasons. But I would say if folks want to send me an email, I'm always happy to to chat um, with folks. For sure. For sure. Yeah. I really appreciate how intentional you are with the way that you use terms like this is a new way of just for me thinking about myself as a newcomer, I think that's beautiful. I think it changes so much. So I'm like, I remember saying this to you. I'm, like, I'm Canadian. <laughs> yes. What do you mean by newcomers? And that was that was very uh, that was very life changing. So I really nice. appreciate that part. Yeah. You're um, welcome. Inshallah, we'll take questions from the audience. Now. Yeah, absolutely. Brother Kashif. Yes, Jazakallah Khair. So before we take uh, questions from the audience, mm -hmm. we have been uh, projecting some of the contact information. So I just want to share the website and the Instagram where people could go to for more information. And I think the email address is probably on here also, as, yeah. as you uh, mentioned. Absolutely. So why don't you tell us a little bit about your service as I just shared this on the screen, mm -hmm. starting with the name. Like a lot of times people mm -hmm. have these names from like, you know, Arabic or Urdu language, right. but uh, <laughs> the audience doesn't really understand like how profound those names actually yes. are. So and I, I think, you know, <laughs> understanding the meaning of this name, I think is pretty profound. So I'll let yeah. you share right. what it actually means and Absolutely. what the what your services you offer. Absolutely. One of the definitely my favorite parts about my business is my name, <laughs> the name mm. of it, which is Nur al Huda. Um, so in Arabic, that actually means light of guidance. And so my mom named me Huda. And I remember growing up, she would always tell me that she hopes that I'm a source of guidance. For other people <laughs> and so i really he held that with me um and so when thinking uh you know with my business manager about the name of it i was like i think it would be really cool to name it neural hoda <laughs> because that is a name that actually um like really resonates so much with me like it means light of guidance um and that is what i hope I hope that is something that I can always do um, and support others. Amazing. That's awesome. Yeah. 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 Jazakallah khair. So, yes, we have a few questions coming in uh, from the audience. So, and we also have some coming in from Instagram. Um, maybe, maybe before we get there, I'll ask a question. So, one of the things you were mentioning was just showing compassion towards people right. and so forth. And, you know, you mentioned Palestine. May Allah make it easy for our mm -hmm. brother and sisters there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when it comes to people that are coming from maybe these, um, you know, situations of war and stuff. Mm -hmm. For example, I know a few a brother here that his family is in Rafa right now. Right. But I always I struggle with this personally. Like, what's the way for me to approach them where and so I'm coming from I'm learning about them from a place of understanding and empathy. Right. But at the same time, I'm not triggering anything. Right. Because yeah, right. I think most people get afraid and they avoid it which is probably not the best way to go so right. how do you approach someone where you know you you want to show that you want to be there for them and mm -hmm. you want to learn about their background so right. you can you know empathy show them more empathy and you right. know be, be there for them when they need a yeah i think a really big piece is being mindful <laughs> about what is actually our intention when approaching this person yeah. is it coming out of a place of curiosity is it coming out of a place of like you know wanting to information gather or is it coming out of a place where genuinely we want to care for someone and understand them but honestly i would always say ask the best thing to do is to always ask so really asking people what do you need what do you have capacity for maybe it's like a meal that they need Maybe they just need someone to sit there with them in silence. But I think what's really important for us is to never assume that we know what people need. Mm. Always be really, and really the first thing I would say is be honest about what your intention is when it comes to approaching other people, yeah. right? Because really and truthfully, we don't really know what our purpose is until we really reflect onto that and ask them what they need, right? I think that that is the best thing. People know what they need for themselves. Yeah, exactly. so asking them that. Yeah, yeah. I hope that helps. <laughs> yeah, that's really helpful. Yes, Jazakallah Khair, that was very helpful. You know, I was, you know, I hate to mention Martin Luther King, but, you know, you know, because he has some views that I probably don't agree with. But there's something that he said that always resonated with me was that, you know, you, you don't remember the words of your enemies, but you remember the silence of your friends, right? Exactly. So I try to remind myself of that all the time. 
Uh, so some of the questions we have coming in, we have some coming in through uh, Instagram also. Um, so first, a few comments. So this one is saying, oh, sorry, I'll put it on the screen so you can also see it. So much needed topic, Jazakallah khair for arranging. This is stuff we don't talk about, but as a community, need to and build safe and welcoming community for all. Mm -hmm. So inshallah, Jazakallah khair. Yeah, so some of the questions that we had was, I try to be empathetic to my parents' struggles, but I feel mm -hmm. so much resentment mm -hmm. and blame mm -hmm. towards them. How to overcome? Oh, that's a very yeah, that's, that's a heavy question. That's a good question, though. That's yeah. a question that I get quite often. Thank you so much for that. Um, I think what's really important uh, when it comes to our parents, and I definitely understand, I want to acknowledge and validate that this is difficult. It's difficult when we have parents who don't have the capacity to care about us in the ways that we need. Yeah. So I really want to firstly just acknowledge that. Um, I think what's really important for us, um, especially when it comes to resentment and blame, resentment, usually what we say in therapy, the first indication of that is actually a lack of boundaries. And I know, especially when we, if we come from immigrant communities, <laughs> and the boundaries, is it's hard. Yeah. Um, but I would say, look at yourself first, because we cannot control how other people behave, but focus on what you can actually control. Because um, it's so, I don't want to use the word easy, but for us to identify what the issue is when our parents are behaving a certain way, it's so easy for us to be like, oh, I wish I can just fix themselves and go to therapy yeah. and so forth. But how can we actually control how we navigate with them, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe, for example, it's when we know that they're behaving a certain way, letting them know gently that we don't have, I don't have capacity for this conversation and maybe going for a walk, maybe taking some healthy space from that, for example. Um, another important piece is, again, I don't want to excuse your behavior. I think it's really important for us to hold folks account accountable in a compassionate way, but really contextualize, like, what is going on with my parents that they're behaving this way? Mm -hmm. Because hurt people hurt people, right? We know this. Um, so... Yeah, I would say the, the compassion towards yourself and compassion towards them, but really and truly focus on what is within your control. But I, I do want to acknowledge it is difficult, but I do hope that is Can I ask, helpful. Um, what does it mean that resentment comes from a lack of boundaries? I, I stuck yeah. onto that. Yeah. yeah, so actually I was reading about that recently. I remember someone, with, um, one of the therapists that I follow was sharing that resentment comes from a lack of boundaries. Um, and that may be because like, it's an addition of things, resentfulness is an uh, accumulation of things that have been adding up over time. Something hasn't been addressed. So mm -hmm. it's like, think of it like growing, 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 growing. And one of these days, that might just explode, right? So we need to kind of nip it in the bud. So and that comes with self-awareness. So we need to be aware of what it is that's triggering us first. Got it. That's yeah. very helpful. Yeah. You're welcome. Jazakallah yeah, one thing I'll add what, that I'm guilty of myself is that a lot of us have never even talked to our parents to know yeah. their stories, right? Yeah. To understand their right. struggles, to understand yeah. where they came from. Exactly. And, you know, so I always encourage people to talk to their parents about their life yes. and where, where they went through. Like, uh, I remember having those conversations with my parents at a very late age, right? When I should have right. had them with them much sooner. Yeah. And I was just sort of blown away by some of the stories mm -hmm. that I heard. And it, it really saw me see my parents from a different perspective like the struggles exactly. that they went through basically for me and my siblings right, right. so yeah it's a really absolutely. good point absolutely absolutely yeah. so oh, the uh, you know it's a it's a question related i think the same person asked the question and it was you guys were also discussing it was uh sorry where did, it was this one here where they were saying parents won't seek help from themselves how can mm. i make them respect my boundaries oh, yeah so it's a good one <laughs> it's a good one so i wish we can control how you know when other people behave an unhealthy way but unfortunately uh that's not the case so what i would actually bring the bring this back to the person that asked this question and say create firm boundaries for yourself um, and control what you can within yourself because unfortunately sometimes our parents are not well enough um, and able to recognize where they themselves are causing harm so in that case that means we have to focus on what we can control mm. which is 
our own self. So having your own firm boundaries. And again, like something I know I remember I suggested to uh, one of my clients recently that she shared was helpful is when her father was really bubbling up and she knew she knew the the projection of the trauma was about to happen. She's like, I don't have the capacity for this conversation anymore. I'm sorry. Respectfully walking away. Right. So really honoring the boundaries that you have and remembering that we unfortunately we can't control what other people do, but we can control our own reaction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 It's That's it's really hard awesome. situation, especially when living with parents. And I know. Yeah. I yeah. feel like even the concept of boundaries, the question is, how can I make them right. respect my boundaries? But the concept of boundaries itself is something that you set and mm -hmm. you don't control the reaction that other people have to exactly. them. Exactly. You can't. But if you've said it well enough to that extent, I do think right. that, like, for example, as you said, your friend is like, I'm mm -hmm. going to walk away regardless of what right. happens. So if you can give yourself that, that regardless of what happens, I'm going to do X, Y, Z, then that boundary, you are respecting it yourself. Exactly. And always remembering that cre the creator knows what's in our heart and our intentions. So remembering that too, he knows what you're experiencing, what you're experiencing in this world, you are not alone in it. Remember that this is not actually a very unique, this is not uh, just like a one, this is not the first time I've had this question. I've had this yeah. question so many times in the past 10 years as a social worker. So I always want folks to remember that what you're experiencing, you're not alone. Yeah. You're not alone in it. We are exactly. here for you to support you. Yeah. Jazakallah khair. So we had a question coming. Oh, sorry, a comment. Great episode. Thank you, Sister Huda, for addressing this. There's a question coming in here. I won't display it on the screen because I can't display it without showing the username and just right. the privacy. Mm -hmm. But basically, they're helping. Do you help marriages in a situation where one of the spouse might be going through narcissistic abuse? Mm -hmm. So yeah. So I have uh, I have experience working in domestic violence. Yeah. It is. It is, it is heavy. It is heavy. Um, so I don't do couples counseling per se, but I work individually. And mostly, actually, it's been uh, the woman <laughs> who have worked, reached out to me, but I have worked with men as well. But this is an area that um, I do support in. Um, and this is also a very difficult experience. Yeah. So I hope that Allah makes it easy for you. I mean, I mean, able to get the support yeah, so we'll, we'll display the contact information again, but we did display right. the website. Uh, one public service announcement I usually make is check with your private insurance as also because obviously you're a registered mm -hmm. social worker. Right. So a lot of this might be covered by your private insurance and people don't even know that. So exactly. uh, most and especially since COVID, most insurance companies have really upped their game on mental health coverage. So please check with your private health uh, insurances through your work. Uh, registered social workers in most cases uh, might be covered. And sorry, we had another question that was coming up here is um, how how can you identify if a potential spouse may be impacted by generational trauma? Mm -hmm. Is them, their parents coming from a traumatic situation <coughs> such as war, like a red flag? Mm. Oh. oh, that's an interesting question. Yeah. Um, so definitely, I think what's important for us to remember is that many of us have experienced generational trauma. Um, so I wouldn't... Um, I wouldn't say that's like a, a red flag in terms of a potential spouse. I think what's really important is understanding how this person experienced and processed the traumatic situation that their parents may have experienced. So how did it actually impact this person? I would try to work more in terms of understanding that um, because again, like this was a situation that was completely out of their control, yeah. especially when it comes to very situ serious uh, situations like war. So try to understand the impact, the impact that that's had um, on that individual, right? Like how have they processed that trauma if they did? How has that impacted their parents' behaviors? Mm -hmm. um, so I would dig a little bit more deeper in terms of understanding, but I don't think I would consider that a red flag because yeah. so many of us have experienced so much hurt that we may not actually be aware of but what matters is what are they actually doing to work towards healing yeah and do you have the capacity to support them on that journey that's beautiful yeah. 
So there's a follow-up question that someone is asking is, what do you mean by boundaries? So maybe if we just quickly want to find boundaries and give an example or sure. or something. Oh, that's a good one. I'm so sorry that sometimes I, yes. I, I say language without defining it. Um, I remember actually I was taught, instead of using the word boundaries, um, like a more easier way to understand it is setting limitations to shield yourself. So behaving in a way that is self preserving. Um, so I'll give you a really, um, really firm example of boundaries. So I remember uh, one client that I worked with years ago, unfortunately, uh, both of her parents are not well emotionally. And so what we work through is she noticed that when she spends like a long time with her family, like if she's, she's spending the day with them or something like that, because she, did, she didn't live with them, she would get very triggered and very, very anxious. So we discussed, okay, how can we set boundaries with interaction with their families? Because we you know, we know Islamically um, not to cut off our families if there is still potential. Again, there's a lot of nuances there. Mm -hmm. um, but she didn't want to cut off her family. She still wanted to engage with them in a way that is healthy for her. So we discussed spending kind of like certain allotments of time with them. So say, for example, um, if it's iftar during Ramadan. So spending iftar with them and then just spending that hour or two and then saying, hey, I got to go for prayers. Or for example, if it's Eid, saying, hey, I could only come from like 12 till 2, um, but I'll be here that time. So setting certain allotments uh, that work for her. So her boundaries was spending very specific time with her family because she knew that if she spends a whole day with them, that she will get triggered. So that's a really uh, tangible example of what a boundary is. But really thinking of it as, and I know the, the word boundary is so North American. <laughs> um, set it, think of it as setting limitations for yourself to preserve your own mental health. So I hope I hope that helps. Yes, Jazakallah khair. So um, I think that's it for the question. So Munta, maybe we'll pass it back to you to sort of wrap up maybe one question i'll ask uh, here is um obviously we're sitting in a masjid here so the, we thank masjid dariman for their generosity for letting us host this uh platform uh you know one one thing and i ask it with the intention of doing better as a community obviously masjids are places where people congregate right. the community comes together mm -hmm. for the various masjids across the city mm -hmm. what are some sort of tips you could give them to build like sort of safe welcoming spaces some yeah, easy right. like quick hits because we always talk about funding and must just needing right. money but there's a lot of things we could do that don't cost anything right so exactly. if any must management is listening what are some tips we could we could mm -hmm. sort of give them and as a community implement to right. sort of build welcoming spaces Mm, that's such a good question. I was thinking about this recently. I think what I've seen actually, interestingly enough, um, because I work beyond Muslim communities, I work with a di diverse range of communities, and I always love to learn from other folks. Um, and what I've learned, especially from folks who are non-Muslim, non is the amount of connectedness and how much they support each other. Mm -hmm. And I personally feel like just from my, my personal experience as a Muslim, I haven't seen or experienced that. Yeah. as someone who grew up in masjids. I think what's so important is that we are connected and genuinely and authentically support each other. I know it's so easy for us to tear each other down or comment if someone's doing something wrong or like, yeah. you know, they say haram police someone. But what if we actually instead worked from a place of compassion and asked ourselves, how can we actually support this person mm. who is struggling? Exactly. Right. And this is a narrative that I've heard actually from quite a few Muslims, unfortunately. Um, and I know there's again, like I know a lot of Muslims are doing a lot of beautiful work, yeah. um, but I want us to also critique and reflect upon how can we be even more supportive to our young woman, our young woman, especially women. <laughs> There's not, as, you know, certain areas in the masjids, unfortunately for them. I think we're getting better. But, you know, how can we be more inclusive of kids? How can we be more inclusive of using the knowledge that our elders have? Yes. So I would really encourage folks to think about how we can be supportive and compassionate to each other. And how can we be there for each other yeah. instead of tearing each other down? That's a beautiful response, especially as someone who works like with the masjids. Yes. I'm already thinking, oh, how can I do this? How can I be supportive? <laughs> it's very yeah. helpful. Absolutely. Um, Sister Heather, do you have one tip, one thing that anyone who's watching the podcast can take away from today? Yeah. 
honestly, I would say like love yourself truly. You are deserving of being loved and loving yourself. I know right now is especially really hard and we lose ourselves especially, you know, as women, we really do lose, lose ourselves. Um, but really, truly, authentically love yourself because you are deserving. You are so deserving of being loved. Um, so that's what I really want people to take away from today. Jazakallah khair. Thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. We really appreciate it. Jazakallah khair, Brother Kashif, and our whole team who help support um, every day producing and creating this content. And inshallah, we'll see you all next week. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.